Hello and welcome to the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest is the CEO of UpCoach and a veteran entrepreneur who has been building in the SaaS and e-com space for over 20 years with multiple exits. His passion is to help individuals and their organizations reach their full potential. He now focuses on a small handful of startups and his passion project, Managing Happiness, Peak Performance Group Coaching. Welcome to the show, David Hensel. Hey, hey, thank you very much for having me. So excited to dive into this conversation. Your work is fascinating. I like how you merge uh, successful entrepreneurship with the idea of peak performance and managing happiness and, you know, balancing life, which can be incredibly challenging for any individual, especially entrepreneurs. So you have a lot of um, topics I'd love to dive into, but I'd just love for you to get us started with a little bit about your background. How did you go from, you know, entrepreneur exits, which are really hard for people to do, you know, to exit a company successfully and do it m multiple times and then move more into peak performance and, you know, optimization and lifestyle. Sure. So next story, I'm from Germany originally, and um, I was always at the round peg in a square hole or I, I never fit in. I went to 14, 14 different schools. I got kicked out everywhere. And at some point I was pretty lost in life and didn't know what to do with my with my with myself. And a friend of mine said, like, hey man, you you work with computers. How about we start a business together? And I'm like, sure, I have nothing else going on. And then I found entrepreneurship and it's just like my uh kind of finding my thing where I can do what I want to do and nobody's forcing me to do whatever what 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 they want to do. And I uh, had a few businesses in Germany, but was drawn to America because in the early 2000s, there was no startup scene in Germany. And it was like very attracted to what was going on in the US. So I sold my business. Um, actually, funny enough, one of the e-commerce businesses I had in the early 2000s was selling hookahs, Nagile, Egyptian water pipes, because we just talked about Egypt before. <laughs> uh, so, and this gave me the money to get my investor visa to move to the United States where I co-founded the startup, which we successfully sold in 2015. And then my wife went through breast cancer, knock on wood, she's okay, actually. Yeah, she, she, she's okay. Um, and this was like a big wake up moment for me where I imagined myself laying on my deathbed, looking back at my life, thinking, did I really do what I was supposed to do? Did I have the impact that I want to have? You know, it's like, you know, growing the business was fun and chasing Benjamins and stuff, you know, was, was all good. But I felt it's not, you know, kind of looking back at my life, I didn't feel it was like a life really well lived because I did not have enough impact. And so I thought like, hey, how can I have that impact? And actually I sold the business. I, I talked to my business partners. I didn't talk them into it, but we decided to sell the business and so I can focus on something else. And I was kind of like still searching, like, what is the thing that I can do? And something was close uh, because my wife and I have been doing this for years was applying business principles to our personal lives. And I know you just shared you, you have a kid and you have one on the way. It initially started when I came home from a long meeting about the roles and responsibilities at Maxi then, my business back then. And then I was sitting on the couch at home and my daughter Emma had a full diaper. And I said like, hey, honey, look, Emma has a full diaper. And my wife got really upset because she thought I'm telling her to change her diaper, which was not my intention. <laughs> uh, and then I thought, like, why is she so mad? And, you know, and I'm like, oh, we never talked about the roles and responsibilities in the household before. And the next morning we sat down and we spelled it out. Like, what, is, what do I expect of her and vice versa? And this took away 80% of the friction we ever had in our relationship. And I thought like, damn, if this works so well, maybe we take other elements of business and apply it to our personal lives. Like having family core values, having a mission and a vision, having regular meetings, having a shared calendar, shared to-do system, kind of like all these things you do in your business uh, applied to our personal lives. And this worked like a charm. And so I thought, yeah, if this works so well for me, maybe we can you know, turn this into a course and share this with others. And this is what Managing Happiness became over the years. It's this peak performance of running your life the same way you run a business by really thinking about like, what do you really want? What's your mission and vision? Um, you know, setting your goals, figuring out your habits because your habits determine everything in your life. You know, if you're obese or in shape, if you're rich or poor, happy or unhappy, it really all boils down to the habits that you have and integrate into your life. And so I've been doing this for a while, 
and um, but it was an online course and only 7% of people completed this course, which really bugged me because I was not doing this for money, I was doing this for impact. I thought my course must be horrible because nobody's completing it. <laughs> and so um, I looked into this, actually a good completion rate for an online course. A lot of Udemy courses have like sub 1% completion rate. And so I thought, how can I get this into people's heads? Um, and I started cohort-based group coaching. Basically, people watch some videos, get some homework, and then we meet once a week with a group of peers and do this for eight weeks. And now I have a 93% completion rate that really flipped on its head. But it was pretty taxing on me uh, because it was just like, you know, cobbled together from, with course software, Google Docs, like you know, a bunch of stuff. And so I asked um, the CTO of one of our businesses to build me a tool that can help with this. And it turned out to be a really good tool. Um, and I reached out to Todd Herman. He's a very successful coach. He wrote, wrote the book, The Auto Ego Effect, New York Times bestseller. I might have had some entrepreneurial dinner and um, I didn't know him that well, but I know that he's the best, most well-known coach that I know. He, he scaled and sold multiple coaching businesses. So I thought, like, hey, I'll show this guy what I built. You know, maybe other coaches can use this. And I recorded the loom and sent him the message. And so I came in, I built this thing. I'm not a coach by trade, but I built it. What do you think? And he responded with, like, this solves 80% of my business problems. Uh, I want to invest in your business problem. I'm like, cool. <laughs> so I went on that route. And um, this is UpCoach today. It's, uh, it's this coaching software. And along the way, I also I read this book called um, Conscious Capitalism by John Mackey, the founder of Whole Foods. And this really changed my view on business. Um, the old way of doing business is you have to increase shareholders value. You have to make the owners of the business rich. But the conscious way is you do good by all stakeholders, meaning suppliers, employees, customers, shareholders, environment, society, you know, kind of everything the business touches. It's basically a net positive for this. And if you have this, then a business is the best vehicle to have a positive impact in the world. I was like so fascinated by this. this is why I started a bunch of businesses and bought a few businesses and I built this portfolio of companies to provide as many people as possible um, a great place to work. And um, my goal is to get to 10,000 employees. Currently, we had like 500-ish. Um, so this is my, so, but I have like business partners and general managers who do the day-to-day. I mainly focus on managing happiness, up coach, and love, not fear. Fear. That's my, I want, I'm working on creating a movement that everybody in the world understands that every decision that you make is either out of love or out of fear. Just say two basic emotions for everything. And this idea had like a very big impact in my life. Um, I used to be very introverted. I um, used to, was even uncomfortable with running a meeting with my own team or like, you know, public speaking or being on a podcast that would have never done in a million years. You know, it was, it was just like, because like, eh, I was full of fear. Um, so I felt like, okay, how can I overcome this? So I um, went to Toastmasters, public speaking classes. I did this twice a week, even though it was like very uncomfortable, very, very uncomfortable. And I went to two networking events per week. It was also like, it was really horrible, uh, but... The exposure therapy helped and I overcame my shyness. But then the real transformation happened when my yoga teacher said, every decision in life you make out of love or out of fear. And this was like, was like blew my mind because it's the universal truth, but I could apply it to so many things. For example, public speaking or being in a podcast. Before I thought like, hey, do people think what I'm saying is stupid? Do people think I look weird? Do people think I have a weird German accent? And, you know, <laughs> And it was always about me and full of fear and then I can't present. But if I switch this and act out of love and I think like, hey, what I'm sharing can help people in their life and the business becomes very easy to do this, you know, or selling. I used to hate sales with a passion. I felt like a used car, car salesman shoving something down somebody else's throat. But if I sell out of love, if I know, hey, my product that I have can help this person in their life and their business, I can even be pushy. You know? So like, hey, Matthew, freaking buy this. It's going to help you. It's going to be amazing. You know, because it's about you. And I want to provide you value. I want to improve your life versus just like making a buck or paying for a mortgage, you know? So yeah. So this was a very long answer, but it's like kind of me in a nutshell right now. <laughs> well, I appreciate the full answer and it's a, an incredible journey. And I love what you're doing now. I feel like it's so important 
as well, looking at the decision making of love over fear, it's it's so important. And another way that I like to frame that is, you know, is what you're doing for you, like the benefit of, you know, selling the course or doing what is it so you gain something? Or are you thinking about what can I give? What can I give back? How can I serve people? And it really changes the paradigm of how you approach things, right? And like you said, I know this thing's really good. And I know it can impact you. And I know it can change your life, right? And you've got to kind of take that step. Maybe it's as simple as personal training for somebody who's out of shape being like, look, I can give you the tools that'll help you with accountability, you know, all these different tools to help accelerate your process, you really believe in it. So I think that's very important. I'd love for you to touch on just the guidelines or the principles for the peak performance um, lifestyle or family. Cause you talked about the mission statement, like what are those core things that you get people to do? Because I think they're great exercises. And for people who listen to the podcast, I hope that they <clears throat> listen to people like you and then go ahead and do the exercises because hearing was one thing, but going ahead and just applying even one thing that you heard is so important. And I remember having this quote on my wall I was really inspired by Bruce Lee when I was a kid. And it says, knowing is not enough we must do willing is not enough we must apply and so you could have all the knowledge in the world but if you haven't applied anything you're not going to uh, create wisdom you're not going to have experience you're not going to have failures and so you know that format that you shared there is so key and i've done it for myself but i just i like doing those things so i'm curious if you can give like the framework that you share sure so the end product is having a document that has your mission and vision for the three most important areas of your life like you you personally right? Mind, body, spirit. Then you as the family person, even if you don't have like, you know, married with kids, but just like you still have family or like people around you, your tribe, how you want to show up there. And um, then you as the professional, how do you want to, you know, what's your mission and vision there? Then defining your core values and also your goals that you have, like in these different areas. And um, also your OKRs, your objectives and key results in, in each different area. And um, you do every quarter, you fill this doc out again, kind of go, going over it and really defining what you really want out of life. Because most people have no idea what they want out of life. They just like keep up with the Joneses and, you know, do what it, what's popular to do. Or like, you know, oh, my father wants me to become a lawyer, so become a lawyer. It's like, no, I think it's really important to really dig in, do the work to figure out what do you really want? What makes you happy? What change do you want to see in the world? And um, this is kind of like the, the thing where it's, it starts for people. And one exercise we do in the beginning is writing your own eulogy. Um, you know, imagine you're dead you're in the casket or in an urn or whatever. And the people that are important in your life come up and give a speech. And then, you know, what would you like your daughter to say? What would you like your wife to say? What would you like your, or whatever? If you don't like the idea of your own eulogy, it could also be like, there's a New York Times article about your life on your 95th birthday like what do you want people to say you know and it comes from seven habits of highly effective people Stephen Covey's book you begin with the end in mind you know when an architect builds a house you know like begins with the end in mind and you kind of work backwards to what you want to do to achieve this it's like like one big pillar of managing happiness define this document then there's the game plan which is like a weekly plan on what you want to tackle this week you know, kind of like first figure out like what do you want to accomplish in this 90 days, then what do you want to do in 30 days? And you kind of like break it down into smaller chunks. And so you know like what kind of input you have to deliver to actually achieve the output in the end, similar to how you run a business, right? Just kind of like just breaking it down. That was a very coding yeah. answer. The last one, I was just imagining you doing some coding for your SaaS websites or whatever. <laughs> what is the input to get the output that I need? And it's true though, but it's just a, a funny way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I, I wear my nerd glasses here, even though I switched to, to the dark side of business and marketing. Yeah. I used to be a Linux, a Linux well, you need, system you know, and network it, engineer, but. Yeah. And you need both, right? Like that's so important because I love how you're merging that. Uh, and I'd love for you to continue. My apologies for cutting you off. But like that inner world of what is, who are you? What is it that you want to create? And that's something that I'm very good at. I can think about a lot of things I'd like to create. The challenge that I have is because that's how my brain works you know, dominantly it's, then it's the sequence it's the input and output to make sure that I'm adding that planning thing. And you have to merge the two. That's, that's so key. And even if you're working a nine to five, if you get really clear in your core values, you can improve your life at home. You can improve your friends. You can improve how you work at uh, in business. But then if you have this idea that sparks just adding a focused 
you know, hour every day, you know, and how bad do you want it? Just one focused hour a day, you get up earlier before work and you just focus on that. And you'd be surprised because I know a lot of people end up getting a lot of time. They get a weekend, they get a week off, you know what I mean? And like, oh, I got this weekend, I'm going to go hard at my business. And then they end up barely doing anything because it's, it's a bit of overwhelm. There's a lot of space. So just that one hour productively over time is massive. So I'd love for you to continue. My apologies for cutting you off because that was yeah. all great. No, no, worries. no, absolutely. Like if you do something on a daily basis, even just like 20 minutes if you work on something for 20 minutes if you consistently post something on social media about whatever topic kind of staying consistent you'll be amazed like what you actually can achieve um somebody who's in my um eo chapter entrepreneurs organization his name is mark moses and he scaled two businesses to over one billion with a b um and he has a coaching business now called ceo coaching international and he says i forgot how he called it i call it internally the magic metric if you figure out what is the magic metric, which is a repeatable thing you can do. It's measurable and repeatable. You can do on a daily basis that leads you towards your outcome, right? If it's a fitness goal, like, you know, doing military burpees, like if you do 20 or 25 military burpees every day, you're going to be like really in, in, in shape, right? And it's measurable and it's repeatable. If you do for one hour outbound calls, if you really hammer it every day, or like sending up on emails, you want to go get to your sales goal. You know, it's just about like relentlessly doing the work over and over every day. It's as I said in the beginning, I think habits determine everything in your life. If you're rich, poor, happy, unhappy, you'll be so in shape, right? If you really stick to the things and you do them over and over, you can't go into this hypnotic rhythm. And then you'll, yeah, it, it's phenomenal what you can achieve. I, so I love that. Him, I love oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I no, no, you. No, you, I can talk, 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 talk for hours about. It. <laughs> well, I, so the only thing I wanted to address was before you know when you talked about the regrets, right? Seeing your wife and thankfully she's okay. You know, I was like, oh, am I making my life uh, meaningful and impactful by my own definition, or am I just living and existing here? And that's a powerful thing to consider, considering your mortality. They talk about that in Stoicism and a lot of the Buddhist books and all that kind of idea as well. The other thing to consider is what makes you think you have till 95? And I love the additional question is, is what would you do if you only had a year to live? So you take that 10 year in that life and you start to scale it down because we don't have a guarantee of 95, that that will be great. And so, you know, it's always tomorrow. It's always next week. It's always retirement. And the idea of say, what if you had one year to give your absolute best to who you were, or at least to change the direction? I feel like it's an, a powerful additional question to consider. Yeah, absolutely. I think you have to I forget what the, the saying is, but I guess you should do both. You should act like you die tomorrow, but you should also act like you become 105. You know, so kind of like, um, I can't get, there's like a saying that like kind of makes a lot of sense out of this. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't get it together. But like the idea is to kind of really do the important things, but also not being being wasteful and kind of being mindful that you play the long game. I play the long game in, in everything, in business, in relationships, in health. You know, I was... I don't drink, I don't smoke, I do intermittent fasting, I'm vegan, I work out like minimum three times a week with a personal trainer. And I also go for, for runs three, three times a week. You know, so I'm very religious about this because it just makes your life so much better if you, if you play long game. You do not give in to the short-term gratification type of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, there's that, uh, there's a little experiment that they did with kids and donuts <laughs> and they, they said they can get like one donut now or Timbit or something that are three mm -hmm. in 20 and almost all of them just ate the Timbit and you see the kids working around. That's how most of us are triggered. Right. And that's how we're, we're looking for these quick fixes throughout the day through social media, get the dopamine hits. Right. And rather than looking at the long-term meaningful goals of what we want to create in five years and 10 years. And that's a very powerful perspective. Um, I'd love for you to, if you had an additional insight, please share it. But I'd love for you to also talk about, um, you know, your kind of tools or frameworks for peak performance, if you're helping people in that. And then also the balance factor, maybe they're in a nine to five job and they're trying to balance the job in life, or maybe they're in the entrepreneur world and they're putting everything at it. And if you've been in the entrepreneur space, it's not all success. It can be failure and that can be challenging because you have money issues. You have all this different stuff. And, um, how do you help people manage all those ideas? You know, it's like, I went for it. 
but then I failed. And that's what people's biggest fear is too, because they want to provide for the family most of the time, or they want to make sure that they have a house and they can afford their bills and all that kind of thing. So they have to deal with real life issues as they pursue something meaningful because uh, they're not sure, you know, how is it going to actually make them money? I guess failure stands for first attempt in learning, right? It's F-A-I-L, you know, fail, first attempt in learning. So it's, it's, it's definitely an... an difficult thing if you have family already and then you want to go into your entrepreneurial journey i think we could like film multiple podcasts on that um in general like to you know i think tarzan is a good analogy like he goes from one grape wine uh, from one wine to the other but he only lets the first one go before once he holds the other one and also kind of like if you do something entrepreneurial like kind of do it as a side hustle and that's you know, and once it has grown big enough, then um, you can let go and fully focus on it. Also, do not keep up with the Joneses, like live below your means. Like it's, you really don't, you're kind of being stoic. You not need a lot of things, a lot of things are just like optional. Um, so say, yeah, that's, that's like one, one thought on entrepreneurship and, and feeling. Yeah. I love it. Well, I think the Tarzan analogy is a great one because it has me, you know, it's one of the things that I, I've been trying to share more in the podcast. It's, you know, someone wrote me once. He's like, you can't just quit your job. And I, and I wrote back and I was like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying quit your job because you can have absolute happiness and fulfillment in any kind of job. The idea is if there's something in you that you want to express have you ever sat down and considered your mortality what's most important to you what are your values what do you want your legacy to be and what are those inner inspirations and those you have to cultivate and grow and maybe for me it would be something like being a martial arts teacher <laughs> in my town to you know affect kids positively mm -hmm. right so i could have a regular job and then i could do that or maybe i'm like you know what uh, i really like this maybe i could start my own gym and then that might be a three or five year process and then maybe you have your own school or whatever the case is it will begin to unfold and flourish as you put attention, energy, and focus to it. And you also be very clear because it's it's your deepest inspiration. So that's the invitation. It's not just to, you know, explode all the responsibilities because life is challenging and we have to try again when we're trying to learn new things. Um, I'm curious in your journey, um, being around, you know, you know, you're you got billionaires in your group and you've had this switch in your life where you went more to coaching what were some of the biggest epiphanies you had in your journey around life and business or some of the best advice you had when you were making these transitions i think or that, that you'd the, offer the, love not, <laughs> the love not fear one is, is still the, the the biggest takeaway that that i had you know actually another interesting thing maybe fitting to what you shared before what this podcast is about about spirituality I had a very broad exposure to different religions. <laughs> My father and a friend brought Shambhala to Europe, which is a Buddhist flavor of religion. So they opened up the first Shambhala ashram, or however you want to call it. And I lived there as a kid uh, until I was six. And then uh, my mother was Roman Catholic and I was an altar boy. So I had like the exposure to Buddhism and Christianity on a very deep level. And my wife is Muslim, so I converted to Islam. I lived Islam straight for seven years, like the whole shebang, even though she just did not, but I got interested into it. And I read up on it. And, and then I moved to LA and I became more spiritual. So that was this broad exposure to different religions. And I also think that if you really boil it down, what they want to sh tell you, the essence of it is also make decisions of love and not out of fear. Right? I think that's like the, you know, even say like, you know, heaven and hell, do not exist somewhere else. They're just like here in the moment. The only moment that exists is now. And if you're in a state of love, you're in heaven. If you're in a state of fear, you're in hell. You know, and also like reading Napoleon Hill's books, um, Outwitting the Devil, for example, he also shares this like God is positive energy and the devil is negative energy. Um, so I think that's like something something to consider also. Like when you start your business, to kind of do it from a sense of being of service. You know, helping others. Money is a side effect of providing value. Find a way to provide massive value to lots of people, and you'll make money. I love that. And recently, actually, another guest shared Napoleon Hill's Outwitting the Devil. And he said, you know, most people know about 
uh what is the one something get this something about getting think rich. and grow rich yes think and grow rich right so that one is incredibly popular and he said you know outwitting the devil is a is a far superior book and it's interesting because fear and guilt and shame prevent us from doing our best when i'm working with athletes specifically it is this old trauma they have of not feeling good enough something happened in their childhood oftentimes is the reason where they'll self-sabotage and become second they don't want to be number one they'll, <clears throat> and it's like the same thing over and over and all i do is have a general dialogue with them and then i start to kind of go back and then they realize oh you know what i'm not worthy of being there's something making me afraid of being the best being seen being number one and it's a very fascinating thing your and success I, yeah yeah. And at the core of it is, is the idea of fear. You know, it's this, it's this rooted fear, guilt, and shame. If we can move toward love and service and say, you know what? I am afraid to speak on the stage. I am afraid to, you know, do a t-shirt company. I am afraid to speak up in this circumstance or whatever the case is, but my courage and love is going to trump that. Even though I'm afraid I'm going to do this because my courage and my will to do the thing out of love is greater right? So whatever that capability is, and then that over time helps you to build up that confidence and experience. So it becomes easier. So it's not like the fear dissipates completely. Um, it's just that you're going to choose, you know, more ounces or more power of more voltage of love. And you, you said you're going to Egypt, which I've been to, and we just dis discussed a little bit before the show. And I love, and in the book, the Kybalion, it talks about, uh, I think it was the Kybalion where it talks about, um, the polarities it's all on a polarity, right? So you have love and fear on the same spectrum. And the mm -hmm. idea is you want to use your will, your intention, your life force to choose to move up. And it's one more vibration, unconscious. Right? The lowest vibration is fear and yep. the highest vibration is being a state of love. Yeah. Yep. And since they're on the same spectrum, it's within our capability, our conscious abilities to move the scale up. And that's the distinct, uh, distinction is like we might have something in our environment that makes us afraid, right? And then we're in that experience. But then when we recognize it, we have also the ability to move the scale up the same spectrum and keep it there. But it does take effort and conscious will to do that. One thing that helps with this is also the your words that you use. From an NLP standpoint, neuro-linguistic programming, you know, our words program us. For example, try. I'm working hard to remove the word try from the language because well, everybody's language, not only mine, I think I did a good job to remove it from mine because trying is the most inefficient way not to do something. If I try something, <laughs> I'm doing it out of fear. I try to lose weight. I try to quit smoking. I try, try, try. But it's like, no, I'm going to freaking do this. It's like, you know, very different dynamic. Or when I have to do something i don't have to do anything i have to die at some point but i don't have to do my homework i want to do my homework to get better at math or whatever right and with my team i would never say like hey guys we have to do this no we want to do this because it's going to be awesome for a customer we want to do this it's going to be awesome for xyz right so kind of like we can consciously program ourselves with the words that we're using and also um I guess, how does something feel? If it feels good, I lean in. If it doesn't feel good, I take a step back and think like, why does it not feel good? Is this not in line with my values? Is it not the right thing? Or can I change, as you just said, my my um, viewpoint on this to act out of love? Like, oh, I do not want to speak on stage, but no, you know, it's, it's fine. I, I do this and I can provide value and then it switches and I can act out of love and, and I remove the fear. Yeah, absolutely. I I... I totally agree with that. And you can remember to upgrade your works, uh, your words in many opportunities. Like I get to do this or I want to do this, right? Or I have to do this. It's it's a much more empowering framework. And then it, what it does is it leads back to your why, right? So maybe I'm doing something with the podcast and I have to do all the backend work and I'm like, oh, I have to do this. And this is, oh, I get to do this because, you know, I'm sharing this amazing wisdom from this guest and ideally it's going to help people. That's a much more inspiring frame of mind, a reference, a point of view you then it's it's limited and it's kind of like moves into victimness you know oh i have to do this and i'm you know i have no choice like, no 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 
I'm choosing to do this. And even if you're going to a job you absolutely hate, right? You can say, you know what? I get to go to this job today. It's making an, uh, you know, I'm getting a paycheck. I'm able to afford my house, afford my food, provide for my family. And, you know, you can then go ahead later and look at all those things you hate about your job and then think about the things that you would prefer and then begin to work in that way. But looking at um, all the benefits and the privileges of the experience you're having now. Wow. You know, I can go afford this stuff and it gives me that level up like your Tarzan analogy. This is rope one. And it's not to say, you know, what the last vine is going to be. And even if you fall off, right, like you I like your analogy of, of failure, uh, first attempt in learning, you just get back on and you try again because you only actually fail when you stop. That's that's when failure that's happens. Right. When you, you, you stop don't try trying. again, you do again. I see, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You do again. You got to use, you know, go ahead. S simple thing, actually, if, if you do push ups and you think, like, oh my God, this is so hard, you know, like, F this. And when you think, like, it changes your while you do this, you think, no, actually, I get to do this. I'm so fit that I can do this. You know, I have, like, my body is healthy. I, you know, I'm, I can't put the strain on my body. It, it's, it's phenomenal how this, like, in this second goes, like, dude, yeah, actually, yeah. And you can, you can do more. You know, it's really phenomenal how our, our view on things change or in other things actually if you change the way you look at things the things you look at change for example my mother passed away 10 years ago and if i look at it from a standpoint like oh poor me i don't have her anymore she would live with us in bottom right now or she would teach my daughter so much it would be so awesome to have her then i'd be sad but if i think of from the other standpoint of the other viewpoint hey, I'm so grateful that I had this amazing person in my life. I'm so grateful for everything that she taught me. Other people have no mother or no good relationship with her. So I cherish all the moments that I have with her. And when I think about this, then, then I'm happy. And also, so really, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Yeah, I think that's really important and a, a powerful analogy for people to consider. Um, you also talk about managing happiness. And I feel like in life, and especially in entrepreneurship and pursuing your goals, things can get pretty stressful. And if we can, you know, wake up and be genuinely happy for most of the day, you're going to be 10% of the population, maybe. And I'm curious what you do or what you share to help people to, you know, find more happiness in their life, regardless of their situation. How can they wake up excited and, and experience well, there's, more? There's, happy? There's, there's if, a bunch, even bunch of things happy. Yeah. yeah happy to share. Like there's, there's so many things that, that, I'm doing also sharing and managing happiness. So number one, exercise. It's really important to exercise on a regular basis. Um, I used to think like, oh, you know, I'm not going to the gym. I have should be in the in the office and work. But it's you know, while I'm going to the gym or while I'm on a run, I process things. You know, I can I work through things in my mind and just much better at decision making when I have this balance, right? So it's it's like one really important thing. I think sweating every day is a really really important thing to get like negative hormones out. Back in Stone Age times, when there was stress, it was either I had to fight the saber-toothed tiger or run away from the saber-toothed tiger. So stress comes, and then we have to act, right? To do something that makes us sweat. But now we get stressed by an email that we get or whatever, but and we don't sweat it out. So <clears throat> I think it's really crucial that we sweat. Another thing <laughs> is a gratitude rock. I have a gratitude rock in my pocket, and every morning I pick up this gratitude rock and I go through the things I'm grateful for. My wife, my daughter, my healthy body, my friends, trips, being here, being on your podcast, etc. There's so many things that I'm grateful for. And then throughout the day, I have to stone in my pocket and sometimes I get stressed and then I feel a stone. This brings me back to like, hey, dude, you know what? Actually, everything's beautiful. You know, kind of getting back to this height, 30,000 foot view of like, Dude, I actually have so much beauty in my life. And this little thing, this big problem of the moment is actually six months from now, I won't even think about this, right? And at the end of the day, when I come home and take the stone out of my pocket and I go through the things that went great this day, because often you have a productive morning, you know, podcast, whatever, like lots of good stuff is happening. And at 5 p.m., you have an unpleasant conversation with a customer, a employee or your spouse. And you think like, oh my God, everything sucks, but it's not the case. There is so much good stuff going on. Because we have this negativity bias and this like kind of can help us to actually see how much good stuff is in our lives. And then it's much easier to deal with the tough stuff that's coming. Beautiful. Yeah, well, I love all that. And I just <clears throat> thought of a follow-up question. How do you define success for yourself? You work with you know entrepreneurs and business people. What what is success for you? <clears throat> Depends on which area of my life, of course. I have like KPIs that I want to achieve. With managing happiness, my what's a KPI? KPI? 
a key performance indicator. <laughs> okay. I'm a nerd. I'm sorry. I'm a I know you player. just slide it in there. I was like, I don't know. If I was like, I think it. No, I don't know what that is. I'm going to ask him. So I, it's got to be someone else. Can't just be me. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Tell sorry. us about I, your key performance indicators. <laughs> yeah, like I have like different key performance indicators for for different things. For example, with managing happiness, the main KPI or the north star that I'm going for right now is. Every cohort participant, I want 30% of the participants start their own managing happiness group. So it becomes like the toastmasters of personal development, like, you know, self-organized groups. So it, it, it spreads, you know, so more people come in and, um, you know, find friends, build their own groups to help others to figure out what they really want out of life and then hold each other accountable to actually do the right things, stick to the right habits to achieve their goals. You know, so that's like my, my, um, the managing happiness KPI. And like overall with love, not fear, I want to reach 1 billion people. You know, not, not a small number, but like I want to, in my lifetime, I want to achieve that 1 billion people have heard or understood the concept and can apply this to their, to their lives. Well, can you, can you share a little bit uh, about <clears throat> that? Like how, what your project is for love over fear. One of them that I liked during the last couple of years was faith over fear. You know, and I think that being fearful prevents us from doing so many things. A small example I'll share with my wife is like where we are with there's grizzly bears, right? And uh, she doesn't want to go out on the trail because she's worried because people have seen grizzly bears. Now, there's a real danger. How I don't have that fear personally because I feel like God's going to take me out whenever he wants. It doesn't mean I'm going to go to a grizzly den. I just know the statistics are very, 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 no. very rare. It's like not swimming in the ocean, right? You're on a nice boat yes, and I'm terrified. I'm terrified of sharks, right? But I'll try and like overcome that to jump in the water because the likelihood of jaws coming up and getting me. And the reason why I have this is because when I was small, uh, that a shark documentary and I was like three years old watching these gigantic sharks coming out of the mm -hmm. ocean it's just blue and then they eat these big slabs of meat it's still in my brain every single time I swim all I see is these jaws coming out of the deep blue and it's terrifying however that will prevent me from just enjoying a nice swim enjoying the beach right and so um, yeah so I'd, I'd be curious what your thoughts are on all that yeah, I guess what you just did you rationalized it you know for example okay <clears throat> I feel fear I feel I'm doing something it does not feel good okay then i take I, I realize this i take a step back and think like why does it not feel good as you just did like okay it's i'm it's not feeling good because i watch this documentary it doesn't feel good you know and then you rationalize like hey actually it's like it's probably more likely i get killed on the way home versus like swimming here in the ocean getting attacked by a shark and then i don't know at least for me it becomes much easier instead of okay screw it let's let's just jump in Right. And kind of like, and then once you do this a few times, like with Toastmasters public speaking or networking events, just like going to people and doing this, exposure therapy helps. You know, so you just like do it over and over. And at some point, it's like, eh, hey, we'll do this again. That's fine. You know, it kind of goes away. So it's like that's, that's one way of, of, of tackling this un, unrealistic fear, I guess, right? Right. And so with your, again, to go back to the original question that I had, like the love over, how are you doing that through a different company or is it just a concept? How do you want to share the love so over right, fear right idea? Now I, I started um, lovenotfear.com about the domain. And right now there's a forum on there and I'm, I'm just like sharing um, stories and getting people into, into the community there. And then we have these stickers. We already handed out like 10,000 stickers and a lot of people put them on their cell phones to kind of be exposed to this. And crazy story, actually, my brother was sitting in a cafe that he often works from and he hands out a lot of stickers. Every time she, he sees somebody and he has a minute, he like talk, goes to them, like, hey, can I tell you about love, not fear? And like, I don't want to sell you anything. Just want to tell you about the concept. And so this pregnant woman came to him and said like, hey, do you remember me? And when he told me a story, he's like, is this your kid? And he's like, no, no, no. She just like said like, hey, uh, six months ago, I was sitting here in a cafe and you came to me and gave me the sticker and told me about this love and fear concept. And that day I found out that I'm pregnant and I was sitting there contemplating to get an abortion. And because of you gave me that sticker and you told me that story, I kept that baby. You know, I was like, whoa. And so that's- wow. You know, and just like sharing these stories and like you can, people can buy swag on, on the website, uh, like t-shirts and mugs and blah, blah. And yeah, it's just like exposing people to this, to this concept. It's, it's so, and I, I'm selling swag mainly for the purpose of 
if people have it around them and word of mouth, like, hey, what's this thing? Then there's an opportunity to, to share this again. Well, you know, I love that idea. I've had the idea many times where I thought about like, um, how could I create a t-shirt? And I was thinking about sacred geometry and things like that, that when someone saw it, that just automatically felt good. Right. Because you could go into uh, someone's house. Right. And then they had like all pictures of people being murdered or something. Right. Mm -hmm. And with dark mm -hmm. music, you're like, Holy crap, get me that, get me out of here. Or if you see someone's t-shirt, right. And it's like a, I don't know, some sort of really dark, terrible thing. Immediately you input that and you're like, this is horrible. But when you see, you know, love, over fear or you see something no, inspiring you see so it's the same, oh, it's the same yeah. concept, but it's called yeah yeah love not fear concept, yeah it's right then you're like oh yeah right it's this reminder right out in your physical world that you know i do have that choice and i think that that alone is incredibly powerful and then we can also be beacons of that ourselves of representatives of that idea and i love the short story you share because that is truly how powerful it is in every decision Right now we have another life coming into this world. And yeah, it is, it is scary to have a child. I had one later in life and I was terrified and I have done personal development work and, and I don't know, partially reasonably put together and I was terrified. And, uh, you know, so for the courage for someone to have to raise the kid and know that's the right thing and say, you know what, this is going to be a beautiful experience. And it's been the most rewarding, beautiful experience I could possibly imagine. And at first I was terrified. So I think that the, intention for the company is very beautiful i know you're on a trip and you're enjoying the france or wherever the heck you are um thank you so much for coming on the show i appreciate you and your work is there anything else that you'd like to share or anything you'd like to cover before we close the show i mean just like pushing pushing the selling out of love you know i'm really not selling to 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 make money on this check out lovenotfear.com sign up for the forum uh it's it's a free community basically, or check out managinghappiness.com. Uh, you can get the online course for, it's like 50 bucks per year. It's really not a money-making endeavor. When I'm doing um, cohorts, I just ask people to donate a thousand dollars to the charity of their choice. You know, I really, I'm just doing this to have, have positive impact and to get more people to, to spread the word. So yeah, if you want to check it out, if you want to be on your personal A-game, figure out your mission, vision, values, check out managinghappiness.com. And yeah. Buy some love, not fear swag, spread the love. And yeah, that's, that's kind of my, my, my pitch for the end here. Uh, awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Uh, I'll, I'll check out those things as well. And uh, just, yeah, thanks again for your time. Awesome. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. See you guys. Take care.